Welcome back to another episode of the Falcons Audible presented by at and I'm Derek Rackley. He's Dave Archer. And if you're an Atlanta sports fan, you probably understand why DJ is joining us via video because the Braves were not able to close it out on Sunday night. So DJ had to jump on a plane and go back to Houston. So DJ will be covering the Atlanta Braves from Houston, Texas tonight. But right now he's going to be covering the Atlanta Falcons audible presented by AT&T with us. DJ, thanks for joining us from Texas again. How you doing, man? Man, I'm good, man. I appreciate you guys. Uh, Allow me into the show away from Houston, Texas. So uh, I always love to talk ball with you guys. So let's uh, let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. So uh, let me give you a quick rundown of what we got going on today, and then we'll jump into things. We will get into our headlines, our quick hit headlines. I'll ask the guys to give me a quote, a sentence or two of what they think about the game from last weekend. We'll talk a little bit about the Falcons offense. What did they do well? Where did they go wrong? And then we'll kind of open it up a little bit bigger picture and just talk about our perception of where they're at right now as a team. Then we'll look at the now some Hill Saints. Of course, Jameis Winston went down with an injury this past weekend. We'll take a look ahead at that matchup. Maybe we get into a little bit of stories about the rivalry game because we've all participated in a little bit different uh, versions. Um, And then we'll wrap it up. So that's what we got going on from today. So DJ, I'm going to let you start because you're in Texas. So we're going to give you the honor here. Give us your headline of what you felt the Falcons performance was or what you took away from last weekend. Right. I'm not going to lie. Uh, last night when we got the rundown, I'm going through it. I'm, I had a couple things that I wanted to use, and I've been racking my brain, so I'm just going to ride with one right here. And I'm going to say it came down to the third. And when I say it came down to the third, I'm not talking about the third quarter. I'm talking about freaking third down. Yeah. And we struggled mightily in this ball game on both sides of the ball. Uh, we were 3 of 10 on third down on, on the offensive side, and uh, you know, until late in the ball game when, you know, Carolina was trying to run the clock out. They were unbelievable on third down. It ended up being 10 of 17, but at one point it was like 10 of 15. So uh, this was a game where on third down we know it's a crucial spot in the game and you want to stay on the field and you want to get off the field. We just couldn't seem to do either. So I, I think that was a big part of the ball game is uh, we struggled on third down. Uh, to really get anything really consistent. Yeah, no doubt, uh, Dave. He says it came down to the third. We'll talk about that a little bit more. What's your headline after this game? Headline for me is two steps forward, one step backward. Yeah. I think it was a step backward this weekend, guys. I think that uh, we'd seen a steady improvement of the offensive line. I didn't think they played overly well in this game. I thought that Ryan was under siege most of the game. And then on the defensive side, where I felt we've been pretty stout in the front wall and done a good job of forcing what Shock has been talking about, some longer yardage third downs, got pushed around in the run game up front. So I was disappointed in the physical part of the game. So two steps forward with a couple wins in a row, three of the last four, and then ah, step back. This was not a good, very good game against Carolina. I'm, I'm like kind of hesitating to, to say this phrase uh, because I know it's going to date me, but wasn't there a song like by Paula Abdul that was <laughs> two steps forward, I'll take – I think she said two steps back, though. That just shows how old these people are. I'm sorry, but I had to do it. You went, to the, for, you went to the former Laker girl on us right there. <laughs> hey, some of you guys watching know what song I'm talking about. Oh, I so, remember the song. Okay. I remember the song. All right, so I'll give you my quick headline, and then we'll move forward. I just said Carolina run game drops Atlanta. So, Arch, you and I are on the same page. The run game was too strong for the Panthers, and it to me it was a lot of first down. They had so mm. much success on first down. That set them up for very, very favorable third down situation. So let me turn it back to you guys because I wanted you to tell me what went wrong with the Falcons offense? Because I could sit here and I could talk all I wanted, but I want you and DJ to tell us what went wrong on Sunday with the Falcons offense. Yes, there's a lot of different things you could talk about, Calvin Ridley not being in the lineup, not being effective enough running the football, but Arch, what does it come down to for you? Well, this was a defense that I think we had a good idea. It was going to be a tough test against Carolina. They came in ranked three in the league in total defense anyway, so it was a defense that had, that had been pretty good. But they'd struggled against the run. Uh, They had given up over 100 yards rushing in three of their last four games and gave up 245 to Dallas about four weeks ago. And two weeks ago, gave up almost 200 yards, 198 to to Minnesota. So what do you do when you're struggling against something? You go work on it, right? And so what they came back with is they came back with a decidedly more aggressive defense in the run game. They did a lot of run dogging and stunning up front. And I I think our young offensive line really struggled to pick up blockers. They had a number of run-throughs in the backfield, created negative plays, 
And as good as it was for Carolina because of the way they ran it on offense, it was the other way for Atlanta on offense because you were second and 10, second and nine, second and eight, a lot of backed up situations on third down as well. So uh, I think that the, the problems they created on first and second down for Atlanta led to a, a pretty aggressive pass rush that Atlanta didn't handle either. Yeah, I didn't get a chance, obviously, to sit down with the team and watch the game copy, but I'm sure there was some missed assignments because there was a couple of times I feel like Hayden Hurst, he looked like he yeah. let somebody run free. Lee Smith had another one too where it felt like somebody got into the backfield immediately. So you, you're right, some of those run dogs or run blitzes, as they talk about, well, was giving Atlanta some fits up front. DJ, what was it for you? Is it same running game? Was it something through the air that you thought was the problem for Atlanta? No, I, I'm kind of on the same line that Arch just talked about. And I went back and tried to just make sure that it wasn't just me that I saw when we were talking about the run game. And we had two rushing first downs in this ball game. You know how many Carolina had? 13. And I think Arch hit it on top of the head when he said our offensive line, I thought, took a step back. There was a lot of times where they owned the line of scrimmage. They owned the – where they get a lot of penetration, they did a lot of things where they muddied the water for us. I mean, just look back in the ball game. Remember how many one yard runs or negative yard runs or just stalemate runs we had in the ball game that really affected us. And then now you're looking at second and nine, second and ten, and you know what's coming now. You know you have to throw the football, and then that's when they pin their ears back. So I thought that part of the game was really frustrating. I thought that part of the game uh, was uh, I thought a, a, a emphasis for us. I mean, Mike Davis was averaging almost five yards a carry. Yeah. Probably had his best game. It was 9 for 44, I think it maybe was. But it was still on timely times where you weren't able to run the football and be effective, which led to three sacks in the ball game. And, uh, you know, I just thought some things that we, we didn't see a lot of, drop balls uh, in the ball game. Uh, I know we had some of them early in the year, but uh, at un, unopportune times for sure. It's well, interesting where numbers can lie to you, uh -huh. Rack. And you and I were talking prior to starting today's uh, Falcons Audible you know, you look at the Davis numbers that Shock's talking about. Remember, Davis rips off a 20-yard run. One run was 20 yards. Yep. The other eight carries netted him about 20 yards. Yep. So when you see five yards a carry, kind of doesn't tell the story. You look at their 198 yards they had rushing, and Shock talked about how they're pounding us off the ball, and they were. But Sam Darnold had 62 yards rushing, and only one of those runs was a designed run, which Foye Lua can knock him out of the game on the play. Mm -hmm. So the rest of it was scramble runs. So that that number doesn't really tell the story either. You almost think, okay, we got blown off the ball all day long, and that's not necessarily the case. It was quarterback scrambles that you might be able to to take care of and maybe hem that in where it's not a problem again next weekend. Yeah, and one thing I do want to talk about though, guys, is is we talked a lot of run game, and I probably would have talked about run game as well. Line of scrimmage, they were able to run it, we were not able to run it. But I think we also need to talk about the pass game because Kyle Pitts came off of two great games. And what did Carolina do? They said, well, they probably found out early on that Calvin Ridley was not going to play. So what did they do? They decided to roll over the top of Kyle Pitts on mm -hmm. a few occasions. And they said, if you're going to throw to him, you're going to throw to him in double coverage, right? Well, let's not get into the, the personal side of what's going on with Calvin Ridley. But I think we would all agree that when you don't have that threat – that legit playmaker, either on the opposite side or on the same side as Kyle Pitts, it changes the way you approach offensively, and it changes the way the defense plays against Atlanta Arch. Yeah, no question about it. If you've got weapons on the field, those weapons distribute. From a defensive standpoint, i got to distribute my, my resources. i got to stretch them, right? I've got to put guys in different plays. Now, all of a sudden, you've got one guy that you may be worried about, and that's Kyle Pitts. Now, as you said, you got Stephon Gilmore, who they activated for this game. We don't know Gilmore's a, an outstanding corner. He now can run underneath all the routes, which netted him an interception with safety help over the top. So yep. he essentially is being doubled all over the field. And so other people have to step up. I did think that Tajay Start, Ste Sharp stepped up and made some catches. But there's not a name brand guy. It's not Calvin Ridley or Julio Jones or we name any great receiver, Roddy White. That guy's not standing out there opposite Kyle Pitts. It's just Kyle Pitts. And so uh, I thought that you tried to get as much as you could out of the other guys. The two running backs helped contribute, but there just wasn't enough. And when you're put up to bat, you got to make the plays because yep. this is an offense that's challenged. So there weren't enough weapons on the field. So when I get a chance to make a play, I got to make it. Unfortunately, Kyle dropped maybe the biggest play of the game was the little wheel route. They're pretty good design. 
they would have put him inside the five yard line. Yeah, DJ, beautifully thrown ball by Matt. And yes, is it going to be an easy catch? No, but there are certain times where uh, an elite receiver, and it, we, we, I think we can put Kyle Pitts in that conversation mm -hmm. as a receiver. You've got to make plays. And I felt like, DJ, that was a 14 point turnaround, right? Because that was third down, it's dropped by Pitts. Young Way Koo comes out. He misses the first field goal of the season. And then Carolina drives down the field and they end up scoring seven points. Where if Kyle Pitts catches that ball, moves the chains, maybe Atlanta scores a touchdown. Seemed like that was a huge play in the game. And here's why we expect him to make that play because we've seen him do it. Mm -hmm. Already this season, we've seen him make the contested catches. We've seen him make the catches that are in high traffic uh, situations and he's done it. So for him not to come up with those in those spots, was something that I think a lot of fans were looking at, like, what is going on? I mean, they like you said, we have an unfortunate thing where we never expected. We just talked about it last week where, you know, if Ku's on the field and you're inside the 50-yard line, you feel good about it. You <laughs> missed the field goal, and it's not good. Um, and I, I, I wanted to reiterate one more thing you guys just talked about with uh, obviously having some other guys step up. And, I mean, well, we got to be honest, until these guys are players that can stretch the field and have beaten people over the top, Defenses are not going to stress, hey, let's make sure these guys don't beat us because we got one guy who's going to beat us in Kyle Pitts. There were a lot of times where they got in Kyle's face at the line of scrimmage and tried to reroute him. And as quarterbacks, Dave and I know, guess what? If he's our first read and he's fighting with a guy at the line of scrimmage, we got to get off of it. We got to go somewhere else. And that's kind of what Carolina did a lot of the times against him was try to get their hands on him and force him into not getting off of him. Matt had 20, 20 uh, completions in the ball game. Ten of them went to the backs. So that tells you how you know you had to distribute the football in this ball game, and you know they were a big part of the plan as Cordell always is, and Mike Davis as well. But uh, until what Arch just mentioned, those other guys continue to step up and be more of a issue, I should say. We're going to continue having the same issues on offense. So Arch, after a couple of wins for Atlanta. And they drop a game at home against Carolina that does not have Christian McCaffrey. And a lot of people talking about Sam Darnold not necessarily going to be their quarterback of the future. They're talking about potentially even trading for a quarterback. What's your perception of where Atlanta is now after the game last Sunday? Because it's almost like we got to take this week by week. Yeah, I think that you have to do that, Rack. And I think that uh, as much as I said two steps forward, one step back, I think that you can't get frustrated with that, though. I think there's, it would be easy to say, oh, and you allow that to affect you this week. And the old adage that we all learn player as players, don't let this week, this last weekend, beat you the weekend coming up. So now you reboot, get ready. There's different, there's different matchups. Styles make fights. This will be a different fight than we have, we have with the New Orleans than you had with with Carolina. Um, you just got to learn from your mistakes, and you got to keep surging forward. I think that I think this is a team that'll continue to improve. Uh, there are a lot of. You know, there are a lot of cracks, but you got to try to put put some salve on them and, and try to heal the wounds as best you can. But you can't dwell on the last weekend. And I know that's easy. You know, the fan gets tired of hearing us say that. But, you know, this has been a team that has been made steady improvements. This is a step back. So how do you handle that? A lot of times we're defined more by adversity than we are by success. They had a little adversity this weekend. Let's see how they answer the bell. Yeah, how do they end up t turning the negative from this past weekend into a positive next weekend, DJ? But I'm, I'm curious to get your perception after the game on where do you feel like Atlanta is at now? You know what? I, I'm I'm on the other side of the arch. I'm, I'm frustrated with it. I mean, to be honest, if, you know, we're looking at, you know, how we played and went out and got wins, and then this week we didn't show up and play to the capabilities, I'm frustrated with this team because I thought we were taking strides in the right direction. And I'm sure a lot of fans will probably feel the exact same way. And I know us as analysts, we look at it a little bit different. We know uh, the time these guys put in. But there's just certain situations in the ball game that you look at and say, well, if we're trending in the right direction, we should not have these type of errors. We should not have these kind of mishaps within a ball game. And it's frustrating going forward. Now, the one thing that I will hang my hat on and one thing that I will be happy about is when you, you hear Arch talk to these guys after the game, when you hear him talk to the media, all of them talked about what Arch just talked about is flushing this one and getting to the next one because guess what? The next one is inside your freaking division. And that gives you an opportunity to say, all right, we got the Saints coming in here who's a hated rival. It's easy to flush that last one and move on. They're a little bit different teams, so you got a chance to say, all right, let's take what we did last week, 
and let's build on it, but also let's learn from it and continue to get better. So I was frustrated with the the one step back, like Arch mentioned, but also uh, and hopeful because of what I heard from the leaders of this team, like a Matt Ryan, like a Grady, who said, look, I don't care what's going on. I don't care what happened today. I'm going to show up tomorrow, and I'm going to go to work, and I'm going to lead by example. And when you have guys like that on your team, the other guys around them have no – they, they have to show up. They have to give their best because those guys are going to hold them accountable. So that what gives me hope about this team and these kind of guys is the leaders of this team are built the right way. This episode in part brought to you by The Home Depot. Everything you need for your next home improvement project is just a tap away on The Home Depot app. The Home Depot app digital toolbox gives you access to how-to guides, project calculators, and image search so you'll know exactly what you need to pick up. With the tap of the finger, you can rent and reserve the right tools for the job. Also, browse through millions of items from top brands that you can have delivered right to your door. Whatever your project, find exactly what you need with the Home Depot app. Download the Home Depot app today. So you took you guys talk about short term memory. Got to turn the page mm -hmm. and next week. So let's do that. Let's talk about next week. Let's do it. We've got the Saints on the schedule, and for so many years, when it's this podcast or it's any other show, and you're preparing for the Saints, you're talking about preparing for Drew Brees and the New Orleans Saints. Well, for the first time, we're not preparing for Drew Brees anymore. We thought we were going to be preparing for Jameis Winston. Well, Jameis Winston got hurt last weekend. He's out for the rest of the season. So now. How are the Falcons going to prepare for the Taysom Hill, as we think, led New Orleans Saints? Yeah, well, they, they have some tape to look at, don't they? Because uh, Taysom Hill <laughs> yeah. played in both games last year against Atlanta. So if you want to get an idea how he plays within uh, Sean Payton's system, all you got to do is throw in the tapes of both games against the Falcons. He, he won as a starting quarterback in both those games. In fact, his first start, I believe, was against Atlanta in New Orleans a year ago. So uh, so you're going to be able to have an idea of what he looks like. Does he, in fact, go? He's been banged up. Trevor Simeon came on in relief of uh, Jameis Winston, and, and hopefully Jameis, uh, you know, our thoughts go out to Jameis Winston. You don't ever want to see anybody get hurt like that, and he tore his ligaments in his knees, so hopefully he can get back. But Trevor Simeon threw his first touchdown pass since 2017, so I, you, you got to kind of prepare for both. The one thing you will, you do know, you have to prepare for if Taysom Hill is going to play is quarterback run. Yeah, what hurt you in the game this weekend? Quarterback, quarterback run. run. So they're going to try to run it with Kamara. They're going to pound you with Taysom Hill if, if in fact he's healthy enough to do that, and then they're going to take some shots. But uh, so it's pretty definitive as to what they're going to be. I think the part that's the problem, Rack is on the other side of the ball. Yeah. yeah. Because I didn't think they were overly dynamic last year offensively with Taysom Hill in the game. They moved the ball and did a few things here and there. It was the other side of the ball. Can we get people blocked? That's the problem right now in my mind. We're not blocking people consistently enough on offense. D DJ, when you look at this matchup, do you agree with the last comment from Arch that maybe the biggest challenge is going to be defensively, or do you feel like it's the quarterback run game assuming Atlanta faces Taysom Hill? Well, I think the Falcons have faced enough guys already this season uh, in their quarterback run game where you can have a plan for that particular matchup. And for me, that's exactly what I was going on that side of the ball because of what happened last week. The previous couple of weeks, you had only given up two sacks in two games. Well, last week you gave up three sacks. You know, this is going to be a unit and the Saints that loves to get home. They got 16 sacks on the year. They're only giving up 18 points a game. This is a defense that loves to show up in this type of ball game and get after number two. And we've seen that for years. It's been one of the, the toughest games that Matt plays in every single year and the amount of time he gets hit. So this is absolutely the side of the ball that you focus on. Um, obviously, Alvin Kamara is a big part of them on the offensive side of the ball. I mean, this dude's got 133 attempts. The next closest, Jameis Winston with 32. So that tells you who they want to get the football to. Uh, on, the, on that side of the ball, and that's something that I know the Falcons always focus on is making sure Alvin Kamara doesn't hurt you. But on the defensive side of the ball, absolutely, you got to make sure they don't get home because once they do, it becomes a, a storm for sure. 
Yeah, we we always talk about electric playmakers. You guys mentioned Kamara. I mean, he's the guy that, like you said, you can turn around and hand it to, but he comes out of the backfield and he's just like another receiver. So he's one of those special players that uh, you wish to have on your roster. New Orleans is obviously very happy to have him. So, but let's let's take a step back and DJ. I'm going to come right back to you because it's the rivalry. Let's so let's talk a little bit about the rivalry of this game. We've all been part of it at different stages in our careers. Um, Dave, you were before us, and DJ and I were fairly close together. But, DJ, what are your your kind of thoughts on this rivalry game? Because rivalry is not necessarily thrown around as much in the NFL game as it is in college. But this would be one of those matchups where you talk about two teams that genuinely don't really care for each other. <laughs> and that's real. I mean, I mean, if you just watch the – back and forth from fans on like Twitter or something, or you watch them when they get together, you can tell it doesn't matter what the record is. They always feel like they can beat the other team. And that's kind of how it's been over the years. And I remember when I first got into the league and my rookie year was right after Katrina and we go down there and we play on freaking Monday night football. And everybody remember Steve Gleason blocks the punt. Um, their fans is raucous, is out of control. And this is the first time that I'm seeing what the NFL game is like you know, live at action on a Monday night game. And I just remember Mike coming to the sideline one time and he looks at me, he said, hey, they got 14 dudes out there. And that's what it felt like <laughs> to him because of how crazy it was that particular night. And that was my first real introduction to it. And over the years, you know, obviously it's been crazy with the back and forth with the wins and losses. And uh, I know Dave's got some good stories in game, but that was my first experience. And I just remember after the game, Coach Moore telling us, hey, look, fellas, it's really not much we can do about what happened tonight. Like, this was just one of those times where that team, that environment was just going to get the better of whoever stepped into that building, and it was unbelievable atmosphere. Not to give the Saints fans any credit, but it was crazy. <laughs> he had to make sure that oh, he added that right at the end. Don't give him any credit. Atmosphere. It's a great atmosphere. But, no question about yeah, that. Yeah, there may not have been an NFL team that was going to win that game. Arch, do you have any memories, <laughs> or, or what does this Saints matchup between Atlanta – what kind of what kind of thoughts come to your head? No, oh, it's 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 the the greatest of thoughts because it is it was two teams when I was playing we were trying to play to see which team wasn't going to be in the basement of the division <laughs> as it turns out who which one's going to nudge the other one out we had some classic battles uh, in, in I remember going to New Orleans we opened the season in '86 against New Orleans and and uh, so every team's going to the Super Bowl right on opening day. Well, we came out and played like it. We beat them 31-10 to 10 on Jim Mora Sr.'s first day as the head football coach, Bobby Hebert, at quarterback out down there for the Cajun Cannon, was slinging it for, for the New Orleans Saints. And I remember at the end of the game, I ran a bootleg play, got out of the pocket, and ran for about 15 and bumped out of bounds. And this was late in the football game after we'd gone – on a 21-play, 12-minute drive, Riggs scores on like one yard out. They go three and out. We get it back and go on a seven-minute drive and kind of seal the game with a touchdown. I remember I bumped out of bounds on a little on a little bootleg play, and Dave Wehmer, their starting corner, says, Arch, stay in bounds, man. We ain't got nothing left. So we beat him <laughs> down. Right, Arch. We beat him down that day. But I, the <laughs> one remember if here in Atlanta we played the Saints – uh, they had two guys you may know, may remember the names. Jack Del Rio was playing one outside linebacker. Ricky Jackson was playing the other yep. outside linebacker. Yep. And we had a tendency to run this little bootleg play off this little stretch play. And on fourth and one, we bootlegged one. And I got Del Rio caught to the inside. I heard him say, oh, ish. <laughs> he knew he was beat around the edge. I ran 20 yards for a touchdown. He got there just as I got in the end zone, and I dome spiked it right on him in front of his face. So that's the way it is when you play the Saints, man. You want to rub their nose in it, and you can bet New Orleans coming off a huge win. They beat Tampa this last yeah. weekend with their backup – to the backup quarterback in the game, yeah, they're going to want to rub Atlanta's nose in it. Yeah, playing a lot with a lot of confidence, and 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 I don't know if I necessarily have too many specific memories. Obviously, when you're playing New Orleans here in Atlanta, you're not out the night before, so you don't run into Saints fans. But I always remember, <laughs> and you guys probably do this when we go travel to New Orleans. It's a good place to go. You go out and you can visit some of the casinos or whatever when you have a few hours before you have to have meetings. But anytime you encounter a Saints fan, because look, like. When we're players and we're walking around the street, like, you know, guys are 6'5", 6'6", 260 right. pounds. Oh, they must be Atlanta Falcons. They're in town. So you'd always start hearing the chirping. You guys going to throw the game for us tomorrow? We're going to be there. We're going to be cheering against you. You just always hear it. And even when you're on the sidelines now at, at Mercedes-Benz Stadium for them, the, the – 
stands are a little further away from the bleachers, right? But they sure make you feel like oh, it's close. Feel like they're right on top. Right of on that. top of yeah. you, right? Yeah. And there was yeah. two games that I played in where I felt like the noise was so deafening. One game was there, and one game was against the old St. Louis Rams in St. Louis, and it was mm. that was when it was greatest show on turf and all that stuff. But I'll never forget those two stadiums got the two loudest that I've ever because in New Orleans, like all the noise just stays right on top of yeah. you. So. That's yeah. those are the challenges, the well, communication yeah. and all the other stuff. Hey, right, you're you're right, exactly right. right. The right. Con- I, the concrete roof really keeps that noise in. And I can reiterate what you're talking about. One of the loudest moments I ever had as a player was I was a rookie, and I'm standing on the sideline. Steve Barkowski is starting quarterback for the Falcons. We're ahead late in the football game, and we're we're looking to convert a third down, and so we throw a hitch route with a corner off on the play. And Ricky Jackson jumps in the air and tips the 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 uh, hitch route. It's picked off with us leading by three uh, by four at the end of the game. And I thought, I thought I didn't think I'd ever hear again. The place just <laughs> exploded. It's like your eardrums are gonna pop. And he runs down and returns it down to like the three. We held him out of the end zone on four downs, unbelievably. But the place just I. Yeah, I mean, as a rookie, I was scared. I had to leave the seat. It's almost like you literally feel uh, like DJ. They're gonna blow the roof yeah, off the place. It was unbelievable. Yeah, uh, but I wanna. I, I got a comment, and I wanna uh, ask Arch this because uh, everybody hears Arch calls the game. They see him get a little perturbed here and there uh, throughout <laughs> some calls. But Arch, I want to know what you said because I want to know after you score, you just didn't spike it and walk off. I know you well enough to know. There was some back and forth. There was something you said when you ran to the sideline. Let these people know who the real arch is and what happened. <laughs> hey, uh, I know Sam, that wasn't just a get the off. get the beeper thing ready. Okay. I, yeah. Cue you know what? I didn't use thing. any. I didn't use any proper <laughs> improper words for Del Rio, but Del Rio said his deal. When I broke around the corner and he went, "Oh, ish," you know, <laughs> as I went around, I went around the corner and I only had about twenty yards to get there, so there wasn't any blinding speed. I just had him out flanked. When I got in the end zone. Del Rio's coming up behind me, and I went, yeah, baby, and I smacked the ball down on the ground. That's really all I needed to say because he already had his head down yeah, shot. Yeah, he, so. <laughs> he already knew. All right, guys, before we sign off, DJ, I'm going to give you um, about 30 seconds. Your biggest key or two. Remember, you got about 30, maybe 45 seconds. Your biggest key or two for Atlanta to get the victory over New Orleans this weekend. Well, I think it's obviously not turning the ball over. That's the biggest part when you go into that building. And like Arch just mentioned, if you give them anything worth cheering about, they're going to linger. They're going to do it for the entire time. And if you turn the ball over a couple of times, you throw a pick, you fumble, whatever that issue is, that's going to put you behind the A-ball. And it's almost like you have – you lost two possessions because of it. And if you can hold on to the football and continue to be that offense that we saw a couple of weeks back, that gives them a lot of trouble. It takes that crowd out of it, and it gives you an advantage in that ball game. So I think you got to make sure you take care of the football for one and you get back to playing consistent ball where you keep number two upright. That's the number one thing I think for me. You keep two upright, you got a chance, and you don't turn it over. Keep him upright, give him a chance to get through his progression. Arch, what do you got? It's easy, Rack. For me, you got to match their physicality because they're going to come in and try to push Atlanta around on both sides of the ball. They've had their times where they've done that to Atlanta. We just showed on tape that we can be pushed around a little bit. You've got to match their, match their physicality or it'll be a long day for Atlanta. Yeah, and I'm going to add on top that you got to convert on third down. We got to be a whole lot better than three for 10 than they were against Carolina. And it's not always about third down. It always goes back to first and second down. Can you get those four, five, and six yards on first down? Much like Carolina was able to do mm-hmm. against Atlanta last weekend to give yourself favorable third down situations. So you don't have to pick up a third and 12. They need third and ones, twos, and threes. Stay on the field, convert and drive down, and you got to score touchdowns in this game. I just don't think you can you can just sit back and say Young Way Koo is going to kick field goals and we're going to beat the Saints in their own building. So I think you're probably right about that, but this was a different Saint team. I would say that's exactly right, but this isn't Drew Brees' team. This is not a team that's scoring at will. This is going to be a little bit like the team we saw last year with Taysom Hill, where they're going to be a challenge a little bit offensively as well. We just got to match them at physicality and get Cam Jordan blocked because exactly. we have not blocked him Anytime Please. he plays Atlanta, you go look at his numbers and oh, his sacks, and he's got yeah. a good career. A lot of them are against number two, so you got to get him blocked. No doubt. Hey, DJ, do no us a favor. No do us a favor tonight. Help the Atlanta Braves bring a, a World Series victory back to the city. No doubt. If uh, if it's not going our way, I'll be the guy running the field, so we got to stop playing. we got to resume again later. So 
Just yeah, a couple base sure we, uh, hits all we need from you, Shaq. A couple base hits. Yeah, I got you. Need. you got I it. Got you. All right, yeah. DJ's going to hit a couple base hits, and hopefully the Atlanta Falcons are going to hit a couple base hits on the football field next weekend, a couple of touchdowns and field goals, and hopefully that's enough. Thanks so much for joining us here on the Falcons Audible, presented by AT&T. As always, we appreciate you joining us on Spotify, iTunes, AtlantaFalcons.com, and what's the other one, Sam? I know there's like four of them. YouTube. Yes, that's like the most important one. <laughs> Remember, like, subscribe, <laughs> and share, review, all of those great things because uh, we love to hear from you and we appreciate you guys joining us. Uh, guys, great work once again. DJ, hopefully you're sitting here with us next week. Dave, it's you and me all the time. Right? I hear you, brother. Thanks so much for joining us. That's going to wrap it up. Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. Have a great one, everyone.